It is time! At last, we are ready to start our story analysis of Assassin's Creed Mirage. In the first episode of this new series, we are going to focus on the first part of the ending of the game, so spoiler alert here, just in case. In this video, we're going to have a look at the final assassination of the game, the series of events that led to Basim's ideological and physical clash with Roshan, a bold choice by mentor Rayhan, and the first steps into the Isu vault located underneath Alamut, and the several hints at what it might contain. So yes, we have so much to talk about and not enough time for it, so let's not wait any longer and without further ado, let's start this series. Let's dive into the first episode of our story analysis of Assassin's Creed Mirage. So this time, unlike with Valhalla, we are going to adopt a different approach to our story analysis in that we are not going to start from the beginning of the game until we get to the end. Instead, what we're going to do here will be having a look at the ending of the game, what comes out of it for all the characters at play, its main revelations obviously, and then in the subsequent episode we're going to go back at the beginning where Basim's story actually starts, knowing how to look at things based on the ending of the game, and we're going to trace back his steps and his whole story, eventually circling back to the end and having a second look at it with all the knowledge and details that we will have gotten after analyzing the entire of the story. All of this with our usual style, trying to always dive as deep as possible into all the little and sometimes missable details that the story can provide. And of course, don't hesitate to write to us in the comments to let us know if you agree with our explanations or whether you have different interpretations, we are always very interested in your opinions and what you have to say. So that's our plan for this new analysis series, and like I said, this time we are starting at the end. We are starting at the turn of events that changes everything for Basim. We are starting at the end of his final assassination mission, the mission that would get him to assassinate the leader of the Order of the Ancients in Baghdad that is revealed to be Kabiha, the former top concubine and consort of the former Caliph, al Mudawakil, who gets killed at the start of the game. So we'll actually skip right to the assassination of Kabiya, cause we have so much to discuss already starting from here, while the whole context to it we are going to discuss in the coming videos. Suffice to say though that roaming around the Caliphal Palace in the Round City there are multiple sources including Kabiha's son, referencing not only her being present the night al Mudawakil was killed by Basim, but also her being the only excited and not at all scared person in the Winter Palace and she felt like that, not only because the memory did disc worked, but especially because the memory disc worked when Basim used it. Now we mentioned this in our recent videos already, but just in case the memory discs or memory seals were pieces of ISU technology that we already saw in Assassin's Creed Revelations, which allows users to record their own memories and store them within them and also replay them at any time. So you can get why Kabiha, the head of the Order of the Ancients in Baghdad, might have been interested in one such artifact, and that is reflected and explained when Basim finally tracks her down in one of the baths of the Caliphate Palace, where she says that all the efforts in the region, everything that has been done by the Order was to search for him, or I'd imagine for a reborn Isu or somebody with a proper Isu DNA, and finally she had realized that she had found him when she heard that he used the memory disk in the Winter Palace at the start of the game. That's why she was excited while everybody else was scared by the events. She had finally found the descendant or scion of the Isu that she had been looking for and if that weren't enough, now it is even Basim who has come to her. But this is where things get grim, cause while Kabiha seems to know about Basim, that he is a reborn Isu, he doesn't, but she hints at him being more than human, seeing more and knowing more, she's fascinating him with promises of answers about himself that nobody else has given him, including the Hidden Ones and Roshan. She also mentions that even her son Abu Abdallah asked what Basim was after seeing him touching the memory disk, which she calls the Ancient's Gift. And finally she promises to show him his true nature in Alamut, beneath the Hidden One's temple where the knowledge he deserves is supposed to lie, but as we know, when Basim is about to finally get his answers and is even promised to be set free, Roshan denies all that by finally assassinating Kabiha as she had originally planned. 
and this is where the tension between Basim and Roshan escalates. He plainly asks for answers about himself and what lies beneath the temple at Alamut, but she denies such question. She says that is forbidden ground and this does match her own personality. She is a firm believer in the creed, she is extremely loyal to all the beliefs, the tenets, the traditions of the hidden ones, so those are forbidden grounds and they can't be touched by anyone, whatever the reason. Conversely, because of this almost dogmatic belief in the Brotherhood, its precepts and rules, she also cannot admit the concept of betrayal in the slightest. And so seeing Basim listening to Kebiya really gets to her. So here, the external conflict that was absent for a good chunk of the game actually escalates very, very quickly, especially because Basim feels betrayed too. He opened up about his nightmares, about the genie, and he believes that she knew that the cure for all of that might have been beneath Alamut. But Roshan snaps back at him, saying that he's not the only hidden one that has kept going while being broken inside, and then pronouncing the now famous pour your pain into the brotherhood, which matches once again her entire approach and devotion towards the hidden ones. Still, she does try to get him back to her, asking him to come back to the hidden ones as no more than a man, as in without hopes of being something more, but no less than our brother, as in with the promise of being part of the family and brotherhood that they have always been part of. But at this point, it is too late. Basim now wants more, he wants what he was promised and here Roshan shows some pure badassery by saying that if he even tries to get it, she will kill him herself. And thus, after this huge escalation, Basim is alone. Well, not alone entirely, he still has Nihal, so Anbar and their home are where he immediately decides to go, especially after realizing that once again a mess happened after he visited a palace. So I don't know, I hope modern day Basim won't have to visit any palace in the future or it's going to be hell on earth. Anyway, eventually Basim makes it back to the comfort of Anbar, where he says he needs home and that he needs Nihal. Not only showing that he doesn't want to be alone, which is something that will be important at the end of the game, but also meaning that now he's even more in need of his uh, other personality that the memories of Loki within him can provide, cause yes, if you're watching this video you should know already, but Nihal represents Loki's memories, knowledge and personality personality stored within Basim, as we'll see in our upcoming videos. And when he reaches her and tells her what happened, she is immediately ready to ride together to Alamut, but he is initially against it and he wants her safe. Still, she says that he needs her, echoing his words from before, and she says that she is safe with him and he with her, and even that where he goes, she goes, that she will walk with him every step of the way. I guess the clues were almost in our face at this point, huh? She even confirms to him that he will never be alone, like I said, a recurring theme that will stick with Basim till the end of the game. So the two of them actually leave and eventually reach the eagle's nest, but because of the machinations by the Order of the Ancients, we'll get into those in the later videos, now Alamut has no protection and is under attack, and Basim, tired from the trip, is attacked by the enemy, but saved by Noor in a scene that seems similar but also the opposite of the end of the prologue in Assassin's Creed Unity, with assassin Thomas de Carneillon looking over the dying advisor of Jacques de Molay. In this time, where he is still unconscious, Basim dreams of the genie once again, with some red lighting moving around them, the genie is about to get him, but something distracts it, supposedly Basim's anxious whispers, but it's really tough to say at this point. Still, Basim wakes up, he is with Noor, but no Nihal. Noor explains that the Tahirids who once protected Alamut are now behind the attack, sent by Kabiha before dying or by other members of the order, and sadly Alamut fell, as does Noor, who in the fight to save Basim has suffered a fatal wound, but before that happens, Basim swears he'll avenge everybody, and even in there, in his last moments, Noor says that vengeance isn't the way of the brotherhood. 
If at the Caliphate Palace we were seeing Basim distancing himself from Roshan specifically because of a very personal matter, here we see Basim distancing himself from the creed, from the practices of the Hidden Ones that he very interestingly calls a foolish dogma. Basim is against blindly believing and following the precepts of the Brotherhood, he is against obeying these set of rules for the sake of it, which very much shows why his personality was set against that of Roshan, who indeed is the harshest, most loyal believer in the ways of the Brotherhood. In a way, Basim and Roshan exemplify one of the ironies of the creed that Altair will highlight a few centuries after them, the third one specifically. Here we seek to reveal the danger of blind faith, yet we are practitioners ourselves. Eventually, Noor says that the creed, the ways of the Brotherhood, are what saved Basim and kept him alive and the reason why he will have to save all the possible survivors and that's the common ground that the two can find before Noor draws his last breath. So on the notes of the beautiful rendition of Ezio's family composed for Mirage, Basim rides Noor's horse towards Alamut or what's left of it to save his brethren, yes, but also and especially to see what lies beneath the temple, no matter the cost. So he arrives at the settlement and sees that some hidden ones are still leaving, including mentor Rehan, though they are in the hands of the Tahirids. Their captain is trying to get information from the mentor, very likely about what lies beneath the temple, but Rehan decides to keep silent even at the cost of losing the lives of other hidden ones. And of course Basim saves them but wastes no time questioning his mentor about the temple and what it contains, recounting what he was told by Kabiha, which finally causes Rehan to realize that Basim was the key to open what lies beneath the temple, that Basim was what the order had been looking for in order to enter the ancient ground located beneath the temple that the hidden ones had been protecting for generations and that I surmise they have been building the fortress of Alamut for. Rehan says that the Hidden Ones have tried to protect these grounds especially from the Order of the Ancients who seek to actually use it. It's a classic story that we have oftentimes seen in Assassin's Creed with the antagonists trying to use this ancient futuristic tech and our main protagonists oftentimes limiting themselves to keep the artifacts and tech from falling into the wrong hands but as we'll see it won't be the case here. Rehan says he has tried to enter the ancient grounds but he found no access to them which shows how Rehan doesn't have as much Isu DNA in his blood to enter it but of course Basim does. Rehan tries to stop him to avoid the content of the vault to fall into the wrong hands but Basim says he's absolutely determined to get what's inside for it to fall into his own hands. Basim here seems to be really oriented to use what's inside the vault for the hidden ones, he wants to use that to gain an edge on the order of the ancients and quite surprisingly, Rehan accepts and agrees that this could be the way forward for the hidden ones, drawing a very stark comparison to Roshan as we'll see in our next video. But once again, even if Basim said this was for the hidden ones and maybe he even believed it, this was still first and foremost for himself, with him hell-bent on getting what he wants, whoever would get in his way, of course foreshadowing the final boss fight of this game. So Basim finally reaches the Hidden One's temple used for the Brotherhood's initiations and on one of the walls he finds a symbol, the same symbol that could be seen on the memory disc at the start of the game and that Basim and Nihal at some point even tried to draw on the walls of the hut in Anbar. So Basim approaches it, he touches it and the wall turns into an Isu gate to a vault. This in itself isn't magic and it isn't new for the franchise either, it's some kind of tangible illusion that we could also see in Assassin's Creed Valhalla in the Tombs of the Fallen Activity and those tombs, they also had a similar function for the Isu as the one we're going to see as we keep analyzing the ending of the game. But we're getting ahead of ourselves and we don't have time for that cause this is where Roshan is coming to keep her promise. Basim is trying to get more, to become more and so as she promised she is trying to kill him. 
Her outfit is now dirty and worn out, showcasing she has also pushed herself to get back to Alamut as soon as possible and had to go through several enemies to stop Basim. Their final confrontation is again a very personal one, with Roshan telling him it's his last chance, once again showing to be very loyal to the Brotherhood in an almost dogmatic way, not accepting any kind of straying away from the Hidden One's ways, which she considers a full-on betrayal. At this point, she truly considers Basim's attempt as walking the Order's path, she can't consider this being a different way to support the Brotherhood. And once again, in a more tangible and direct way, we see how Basim and Roshan exemplify another irony of the creed, the second one. Here we seek to open the minds of men, but require obedience to a master and a set of rules. In other words, we are trying to bring free will to men, but we cannot practice it fully, which is exactly what Basim says here. What of his own free will? Eventually, Basim is able to wound Roshan's shoulder and now says it is Roshan's last chance to let him through, mirroring what she told him earlier, and of course this final fight also mirrors the training fight that the two of them had at the beginning of the game and the other fight they had after Basim's initiation. Basim's and Roshan's paths have come full circle now. Basim feels so betrayed by Roshan, he believes she knew everything about him since she saved him in Anbar. After all, she was there when Basim woke up after escaping the palace, she was holding the memory disc and she was there listening to Basim, telling her that after touching the disc, he felt like he was somewhere else, cold and frightened. She knew what this meant, she knew that Basim at least had something to do with Isu and she knew that he could open or could be used to open the door that had the same symbol as the disc that he activated. And even if she knew, she didn't tell him anything and thus she lied about his condition even when Basim opened up to her, or at least this is how he feels. Roshan answers that she only feared what it could spell, that is, that the Order could have used him to get what they wanted and she still believes it now. She still believes that Basim has been poisoned by the Order to do their bidding, but now she believes that the train has left, that Basim can't be saved anymore, in a sense, and Basim even tries to tell her, I'm still here, as in, I am not lost to the Order, I am not gone. But Roshan has none of it, and the fight continues till Basim prevails, starting with the same attack that had shocked Roshan at the beginning of the game, this also coming full circle. Eventually, Basim jumps for a slow-mo air assassination, much like Altair did in Assassin's Creed 1, much like Hytham did in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but he doesn't kill his master, only wounds her and incapacitates her, or rather, he orders her to yield otherwise he'll kill her, but Nihal appears there to stop him. The call by his inner Loki for the vault is stronger than this, but it also seems like it's also telling him to spare her. And even here, maybe for the last time, Roshan notices how Basim is turning towards something that doesn't really exist, as we'll see in our next video. Even here, Roshan notices Basim's mental issues, but I think that here, with this glance, she knows that he won't come around, he won't align to her mindset and beliefs anymore. Anymore. She still tries though, she says that she doesn't want to lose him to what he'll find in the vault, that he doesn't have to look to the past to know who he is, incidentally that's exactly what he'll do, she even asks directly to put his faith in her, but he feels so betrayed at this point, so lied to in order to be controlled and so decides to walk his own path and to enter the vault. Here, it's even more obvious that Nihal is the representation of Loki's memories within Basim. She says she knows what this place is, and we'll see, Loki knew what this place was for the worst of reasons, and she, or shall we say, Loki's memories know what to do to open the door, and that requires, like we said, some Isu DNA, as it happened with many other pieces of Isu technology in the early chapters of the franchise. And in order to do so, Nihal cuts open a wound on Basim's hand, which in my opinion is a parallel to Basim's initiation in that in both occasions, Basim makes a sort of sacrifice in order to access a new world in front of him. 
his life as a hidden one in one case, his knowledge of his past in a deeper understanding of the world in the other. Looking at the blood, Vasim utters the key, which is a reference to how Rehan called him earlier and finally realizes that his own blood was actually the key to open the vault, and so he does, and in doing so, a very peculiar design appears on the door right where the symbol was located, which we tried and put together to have a better idea of how it looks, and it kinda looks like a Norse rune, or at least some kind of rune in general. So Basim and Nihal enter the vault, and of course it is indeed an Isu vault, and more specifically it is the same Isu vault that was mentioned no less than 12 years ago around the time of Assassin's Creed Revelations, and more specifically in its game guide as we mentioned multiple times in our video since the game was announced. More specifically, this is the same temple that Altair would have visited three centuries after the events of Mirage, where he obtained the six memory discs or memory seals, inside of which he recorded some of the most important events of his life, and five of which he turned into keys to access his library in Masyaf, and then gave to the Polar Brothers to hide in five tombs scattered across Constantinople. The game guide for Revelation stated that this vault, located underneath Alamut, stored tens and tens of memory seals, and indeed this is what Basim sees immediately upon entering the vault. Actual very high storages of memory seals, where the seals are actually suspended in mid-air with some electrical discharges going through them every now and then. They are seals that are very similar to the one activated by Basim, each with several symbols over them, the same from the discs in Revelations, but these also have that mysterious symbol highlighted on one side of them, and later on in our analysis we are going to see which purpose these discs might have absolved within the vault. Even Basim asks himself what kind of stories these discs might hold, and even what purpose might the vault have, but Nihal, the memories of Loki, he sort of quiets his expectations and tells him he doesn't want to know why people were brought here. Keep this in mind as this is key in understanding the purpose of the vault. People were brought here for supposed negative purposes. So Basim further explores the vault and gets to its main chamber made out of several bridges, some of which have since fallen. He is shocked at what he's seeing, once again says he can't grasp what the purpose of this building was, but Nihal does, and she says that with a very somber tone of voice, once again foreshadowing why Loki specifically is tied to this place and why his memories hold the knowledge on the purpose of this place. One more detail that the game doesn't tell you directly about the purpose of this location is that there isn't only one final room with the mysterious glowing symbol placed over it. There are actually at least two more, which sadly can't be reached. Again, keep all these breadcrumbs in mind as we'll need them very soon. So finally Basim arrives in front of the final door beyond which lie all the answers about himself. But we are going to save that and all the details about the second part of the ending of Assassin's Creed Mirage for our next video. So join us for episode 2 as we're going to delve into the revelations about Loki's memories, the Isu holograms, who hides behind the genie, the revelations about Nihal, Basen's final decision and the epilogue of the game with its direct ties to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Thanks for watching, a huge thanks to all of our ATA insiders for the amazing support and especially the trust that you guys have gifted us with, and I'll see you in our next video.